Rather than protecting the finely balanced system our founders created, today's filibuster throws the system out of balance, giving one half of one branch of government what amounts to veto over the rest of government. It promotes gridlock. That's Dick Durbin, the number two Democrat in the Senate, on the floor yesterday calling for an end to the filibuster. And he's not alone. Democrats have been talking about this since their wins in Georgia in January, trying to make the most of their majority in the Senate. But two Democratic senators, West Virginia's Joe Manchin and Arizona's Kirsten Sinema, have been resisting that push, and they're not alone. Republicans are sending out every possible warning against it they can. Mitch McConnell likened it to a 100-car pileup, so they would be against it. And for good reason, though ending the filibuster would be something of a double-edged sword. In its simplest terms, the filibuster is a rule that requires 60 senators to agree just to get a final vote on any bill on any subject, even if that bill only needs 51 votes to pass in its final vote. Getting rid of the filibuster would lower that barrier to 51 votes, or even 50 votes and a vote from the vice president, which would work perfectly for Democrats, since they have 50 seats in the current Senate and control the vice presidency. So getting rid of the filibuster would make it a lot easier to enact more of the Biden agenda, but it would also make it easier for Republicans to do the same next time they control the chamber. For more on that and other topics, we turn to Michael Starr Hopkins. He is a Democratic strategist who served on the presidential campaigns of both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Michael, since you and I, and I'm guessing most of the people in our audience, would probably cheer if the filibuster was made extinct, let me start with the contrarian question. What's the upside for Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema to oppose killing the filibuster? Why does President Biden sound like he's against it? Well, I mean, if you're Joe Manchin, if you're Kristen Sinema, uh, the more power you can yield, uh, the stronger it is for your constituency, the more you can help out your constituency, which I get. Uh, and especially for moderates within the party, there's a worry about getting primaried because you're tied to the progressives. But here, what Republicans are going to end up doing is being able to block legislation like the Voting Rights Act, things that are fundamental to our democracy and, you know, really move our country forward in a direction that we need to be moving rather than this gridlock that you know has become what the senate is and i'm going to ask you about that bill specifically in a few minutes but we're getting more and more voices that want to kill the filibuster yesterday california's alex padilla in his first speech on the senate floor called for an end to the filibuster so did dick durbin who's the number two democrat in the senate was part of a bipartisan group that brokered a december stimulus deal do you also feel like there's momentum building with this anti-filibuster group there certainly is momentum building on the side of Democrats. I mean, you're seeing it, uh, you know, from uh, everyone from, uh, you know, Amy to Dick Durbin to, you know, all across the political spectrum in terms of Democrats. And so I think what we're really getting to the point is, is having a speaking filibuster, which means that, you know, if you want a filibuster, you've got to get up there and make your case for hours and hours and hours. And once you sit down, then it would be a majority vote. I think that's a compromise that can allow Democrats and Republicans to be heard and the country to actually be productive. Would certainly make the process more entertaining. We know that the, the Joe Manchins and the Kirsten Cinemas say they want Democrats to reach out to Republicans, try and involve them in debate and negotiations before any changes to the filibuster are considered. But the stimulus bill was probably going to be the one that was going to get the most bipartisan support or participation, and that got zero Republican votes. Is there anything else you can think of in the Biden agenda that could get Republican buy-in? You know, no, but it's not because the policies are policies that Republicans don't support. It's because... By working with Democrats, you guarantee being primaried on the right if you're a Republican. It's kind of the sad state of the Republican Party right now. It actually is more beneficial to not reach across the aisle, to not work with Democrats to get things done, than it is to just perform gridlock and vote against bills that most Republican politicians support. And we're seeing the proof of that in the support for the COVID relief bill across political spectrums. The, you mentioned the voting rights bill that was passed by the House. It guarantees early voting, voting by mail, and a host of other voting protections. There is zero chance of Republican support. They think it'll kill them in future elections. Conversely, I don't know of a Democrat who doesn't think that bill is a critical one. So 
do Democrats try to work around the filibuster on that bill? Should they focus specifically on that bill? And, and any thoughts on how they would go about getting that one through? Yeah, you know, I think this is why we're now talking about the speaking filibuster, because it, this is a bill that's critical to our democracy. When you talk about partic voter participation, you know, you don't have your full citizenship if you can't participate in selecting our leaders. And so, you know, Republicans have made this very shrewd uh, decision that they're going to attempt rather than expand who can vote. Uh, and open it up so that we have more people participating in our government, they're going to restrict it. And only people who support Republicans are going to be allowed to vote. It's kind of the, the long-term goal. Well, what this bill does is rather, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, it gives you the opportunity to make your voice heard. And at the end of the day, that's what a, uh, at least a successful democracy looks like. So I think it's something that Democrats, one way or another, have to make sure uh, is put into law. We know that AOC and the progressive wing of the of the Democratic Party want the filibuster gone. They certainly can't move most, if any, of their agenda with it in place. We've been wondering, we've had conversations, plenty of them, whether anything would come between progressives and the rest of the Democratic Party. Is this it? No, I think you're seeing a unifying of the Democratic Party around this. I mean, you know, earlier I said Senator Amy, I mean, Amy, uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, you know, who would have thought that we would see Amy Klobuchar and AOC on the same side of this issue? But it's where we've gotten. What Democrats are realizing is there is no room for compromise in the Senate with Republicans. And so we can't allow gridlock to, you know, denigrate the lives of Americans. And so where we can work with Republicans, Democrats absolutely should. But where Republicans refuse to even consider compromise, Democrats have to get things done. That is their mandate. That's what they're expected to do. And come 2022, voters are going to hold them accountable if they don't. So I think it's, you know, something Democrats can really unify around. Switching topics, there are now five Republican senators who have announced their retirements in 2022, and there may be more to come. And they're happening in places like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Ohio, and fingers crossed, maybe Wisconsin. Uh, but the out party always tends to do better in midterm elections than the party in power. So just from a game theory standpoint, from a I want to pick the winner standpoint, which party would you rather be heading into 2022? Honestly, I'd better be the Democrats, and that's because of the passing of the COVID relief bill. I think Republicans deciding to vote against that bill is going to be something that Democrats are going to hold over their heads like an anchor, and deservedly so. Uh, this bill should have had bipartisan support from Congress. It certainly has bipartisan support from uh, the voters. You know, when you look at the polls and see 67 percent of Republicans support this bill, I think going into 2022, there's going to be a good case to make for Democrats that Republicans in Congress are more beholden to Donald Trump and right-wing media than they are to the voters. And I don't think that's a winning message for Republicans. Finally, Michael, Republicans wore themselves out during the election trying to paint Joe Biden as a man who had been hijacked by the progressive socialist wing of the Democratic Party. But Biden is a moderate. Everybody knows that. So most of those attacks didn't stick. Then the first bill he signs into law is already being hailed as the biggest progressive policy shift in generations. Can he still sell himself as moderate Joe with that on his record? Absolutely. At the end of the day, Joe Biden is a deal maker. This is the LBJ style of politics, and it's something that Joe Biden has really built his career upon. It's ironic when the progressives are a little upset with you and Republicans are a little upset with you, it usually means you've done something right. And so I think what you're seeing from the Biden administration is where deals can be made, they're made, but where they're not, we'll find a workaround. And, you know, for a party that's really struggled to be able to make hard decisions, I think this is something that Democrats can really look forward to. We're seeing kind of a, an old guard prepare the new guard uh, for the future of politics. And I think it bodes well for Democrats moving forward. Michael Starr Hopkins is a Democratic strategist who served on the Obama and Hillary Clinton campaigns. It's always a good time to talk to him, and we learn a little something as well. Michael, thanks very much. Take care. Up next, a clip that's gone viral, a Missouri dad with an emotional speech defending the rights of his transgender child as Republicans in the state try to push through a bill he says is transphobic.